Hello everyone, thank you for joining us today in my podcast. Today I have a host here, an American woman who lives in Egypt, and I'm sure you will love her story. So Amir, how are you? I'm doing great, thank you so much for having me here today. It's my pleasure, Amira. So let's start by the first question, which is why did you come to Egypt and when? I moved here the day uh, before President Sisi was elected, which was in uh, 2014. So I've been here for six years. Mm -hmm. My decision to come to Egypt was within six months of my conversion to Islam. And I found that when I was working at a Egyptian restaurant in New Orleans, Louisiana, in the States where I'm from, and I had never been around uh, Muslim people before. So my first interactions were with Egyptians and I learned about their country and culture through them. So it gave me the decision to come here. Wow, that's pretty awesome. And I expect the friends was a boys, right? Egyptian boys. I'm sorry, could you repeat the question? Yes, yeah, sure. Uh, the people who you meet, the Egyptian in your country, in the restaurant, they were an Egyptian boys or girls? Oh, I met both. Um, the mm -hmm. owners of the restaurant were two brothers, Tarek and Sharif. Mm -hmm. And uh, the cook in, in the restaurant, uh, her name was Nadia, and she was actually from Alexandria. And she had essentially become my best friend. And wow. I learned majority of uh, the things through Islam was through her. And it was thanks to her that I actually took the decision to convert. She took me to the masjid and I took my shahada there. Wow, that's pretty awesome. I never heard this story before. It's really amazing. Okay, so there's uh, why you actually decided to convert to Islam. What amazed you on the religion that you decided so? Well, I am a very logical person. And I mean, I was raised Christian, but you know, I always had so many questions that my religion had left unanswered. I mean, my, my family, they weren't like churchgoers. They went every now and then, but you know, God was still a subject in my household and everything, but it wasn't something my family really dived into. So I didn't really know enough about my religion. And I had started researching it when I got into my, uh, early 20s and I still was finding a lot of unanswered questions. So when I started working at the restaurant and then, you know, was around Muslim people, I started researching Islam. And then I fell in love with it because, well, the first thing that got me was the position of women. It was incredibly high. It's not like what you would think yeah, through the I media. Agree. I agree the media you. makes yeah, the media portrays Muslim women to be like subservient slaves, and it's actually quite the opposite. I've actually found the men to be more oppressed than the women. Like, I'll give you an example. Uh, financially, a Muslim man is responsible for every single thing with his Muslim wife. He has to pay for, he has to provide a home, first of all, before he even gets married, that's fully furnished. He has to pay for all the bills. He has to pay for all her food, her clothing, and everything else. And if she works, her money is hers as well, and he cannot ask her for a single penny. So I found this to be like, wow, I had no idea that Muslim women had so many rights. And I also had no idea that 1,400 years ago, the Prophet Muhammad actually you know, ended slavery. Mm -hmm. He ended prostitution. He gave women rights to inherit property. He gave them rights to... Uh, achieve the highest level of education they wanted. And this, this sold me there, but I was still, you know, wondering about more answers to the questions of life. So in this time, uh, I was speaking with my father. He lives in Georgia. And I asked him, you know, about his thoughts because he's Catholic. And he said, well, you know, you need to talk to my mother. I said, your mother? I said, I have, I've never actually spoken to her, my grandmother by blood. He's like, well, you know, she's Muslim. And she's been Muslim for like 25 years. You should call her. I said, you know what? I will. Now, the reason I, I never really had a relationship with my grandmother is because my grandfather had divorced her and married another woman. So she really wasn't a part of our family. So I didn't really start talking to her again until I started getting interested in Islam. So I talked to her and she told me about her travels to Syria, Lebanon, and Jordan. And then she sent me some material and I opened it up and it was like 
all scientific evidence from the Quran, like backing the Quran. And that was when I decided to take my Shahada after reading everything she had sent me and finding out, you know, all these secrets within the Quran that answer scientific questions that they could not have possibly known 1400 years ago. There is no way. So I was sold and took my Shahada and it changed my life forever. Wow, that's really awesome, Amir. But I agree with you. Uh, many women, uh, foreign women, doesn't know about the Egyptian mentality and that the Egyptian men have to provide the money to the wife and they think that the wife are slave and they have no rights. So I guess it's our, uh, we have to learn them. We have to learn the woman the truth, you know? Because many Egyptian men are cheating on the woman a lot, really. I met a thousands of men who are trying to steal the money break the life and everything it is so sad. yeah and you know a lot of this has to do with the fact that western women are not aware of the scams that happen in third world countries yeah. because you know i mean egypt is not alone in these scams i mean other third world countries are too besides muslim countries such oh, as course. you know yes. india for example china mexico i mean uh, these are not excused mm. but you know that not all arabs are looking for a visa or money or you know, other yeah, things. of course, not there all. Are many but, genuine ones. Yes, but it depends on the education. I mean, you know, like, I agree. From the Cairo and Alexandra, it's fine. But if you going like to the Upper Egypt, to the desert people, or or the touristic people, they are mostly uneducated men and try to always get some woman for the purpose of money, mostly or get yeah. out from the country. Absolutely, and you know, when you live here long enough it becomes common knowledge. I mean, not just to Egyptians, yeah. but expats who are living here, especially ones married to an Egyptian. It becomes common knowledge that, you know, men from, especially the Sinai cities, uh, Hergada, Dahab, and Sharm el are yeah. especially visa hunters and scammers. And I mean, not all, I have a few friends that are married to, in successful marriages to men from these regions, but most, you know, are just trying to get something. Yes, I agree definitely. Okay, but it's maybe on another podcast, this topic. <laughs> okay, so my next, my next question will be, do you wear a hijab actually, or have you ever tried it? Yes, um, I w- I'm one of those people that dives right in. Um, when I first converted to Islam, I put the hijab on right away, almost right away. And uh, I started wearing it in America, and I had a lot of problems. Uh, I had moved to Arizona, actually, after I stopped working at the Egyptian restaurant, moved to Arizona before I came to Egypt. And I experienced a lot of discrimination and a lot of, uh, you know, racism. I I guess everyone assumed I was Arab. I mean, I took that as a compliment. (laughs) But uh, yeah, I had people tell me, hey, you're a terrorist and, you know, you're a dirty Arab and you need to go back to your country. And yeah, I even was assaulted once. So that really gave me the incentive to move to Egypt. That's when I actually decided I'm going to go to Egypt and, and start yeah. a life over there because I want to be able to practice my religion freely without, you know, being discriminated for it. Yeah, I understand you because I agree in this point. I knew so many women in the Europe who were just a hijab, okay? And they just were so kind, just wear the hijab. And a bad situation happened to them, really, very bad. Yeah. And they decided to took it off just for protect their kin, the family, to be safe. You know, I, I don't recommend wearing any kind of covering if you're living in a, a specific region of America where it's predominantly white. I mean, I hate to say that, but mm. uh, I mean, I, I'm a white girl, but I'm going to say this, that, you know, in, in most predominantly white areas of America, that's where most racism exists. So. Yeah, I guess it, America not... and Europe are very similar in this point. Yeah. yeah, but you know, I did wear the, the hijab for a while, but I did take it off um, because I had sort of a love-hate relationship with it. I no longer wear it and I don't have any plans to go back to wearing it. However, I am extremely pro-choice regarding the hijab and even the niqab. I did wear the niqab for six months. I went through uh, an experimental phase with that and mm-hmm. I did enjoy wearing it. It was beneficial, but because I was living alone, yeah. And it presented a lot of challenges for me wearing wearing the niqab because it became tedious. I have to put it on every single time I answer the door for a delivery. Got to put it on when I hang my laundry outside. So it's I think it would have been much easier for me to keep up with had I not been the only member of the household. <laughs> yeah, 
for sure and a cap is not easy to wear that's for sure no but, but i i am pro-choice absolutely and i always stand up for those who wear the niqab or the hijab mm. and experience Thank discrimination <laughs> because yeah. it, it's a woman's choice and it is no one's right including other women to dictate a woman's body and what she should wear that is the exact opposite of feminism and that's just that's what yeah. i believe sure i agree but yeah i no longer wear the hijab don't plan on going back to it but um uh, i have no problems going uh without a covering where i mm. live i live in zamalek so it's very normal to see other foreigners you know not covering and wearing yes. Western clothing, actually. So I live in a very expat, the most expat oriented area, I would say, of Cairo. So I don't face any problems. I don't have, mm -hmm. I don't even have sexual harassment problems or anything like that. And I'm blonde hair, platinum blonde hair with blue eyes. I don't have any issues with safety or concerns. Okay, happy to hear it. For sure, Islam is about your heart more than about the clothes and covering. I agree. Yeah. Okay, so can you describe your current situation in Egypt, like what are you doing and if you are happy here actually? I am so, so incredibly happy here and this is the best decision I ever made in my entire life. I swear that the second I even convert to Islam, my life changed in every single positive way imaginable. I have no complaints about my life. In fact, my, my life honestly isn't very much different than it was in the States. I have everything at my fingertips that, you know, I could get in America pretty much, almost yeah. everything. I would love a Taco Bell though. And, <laughs> um, you know, I, I, I'm extremely happy and uh, I'm married to an Egyptian and he is a very loving father and husband. He's a good man, he comes from a good family. And, you know, he provides for me and our, our daughter. We have a two-year-old. Well, she's about to be two on July 1st. Yeah, and cool. uh, I, I have no complaints. I really have zero. Okay. And, for example, the family of your husband, how did they accept you to the family? Did you have oh, some problems? Oh, so with easily. Them? No. Mm. Uh, yeah, extremely easily. I mean, I mean, my family's pretty open-minded, too. So, I mean, I would say my husband's is as well. And, you know, I don't face also a lot of the... Uh, problems other Western women face when they marry into an Egyptian family, like uh, communication, for example. Uh, all of my husband's family, they speak English fluently, and they also speak French. And, wow. uh, you know, my husband speaks English and French as well. They were well-traveled. They lived in Europe. My husband was actually born in Switzerland, mm -hmm. and he lived in London as well for work, and he traveled, you know, like yeah. over 30 countries. So That's awesome. his family is the same. Yeah. That's his father seen. was, he worked for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, mm -hmm. and he traveled as a diplomat a lot. And his mother, uh, she was the headmistress of a school here in Cairo. So they usually would meet on her vacations because he never prevented her from fulfilling her dreams of her career. Amr's mm -hmm. family is just not like that. So when she had summer vacations, she would go and join him in whatever country he was in, Indonesia or Switzerland or France. They lived in France for a really long time, actually, which is why my husband's family speaks French. And now my uh, sister-in-law is a pr uh, French professor at the University of Cairo. That's really awesome family, Amira. <laughs> Alhamdulillah for it. I'm happy for you, really. Uh, but Thank my, you, Alhamdulillah. Yeah, okay. my next question is, if your family ever visited you in Egypt or if they meet with your mother-in-law, for example? Well, they've met on um, Viber chat call, mm -hmm. like video yeah. call. But uh, my family has not been here yet, unfortunately. My grandfather, who he raised me, my grandparents raised me. Mm -hmm. My grandfather has health problems. He's 75 years old, so it would be extremely difficult for him to yes, make sure a flight he really wants to and he says if he gets through the medical condition that he has now he's going to take a first class flight uh to get here because he cannot sit in economy with his back so i told him take first class my brother's going to try to come he's working right now and he just finished school so he's still doing a lot and mm -hmm. uh my father also has a uh, autoimmune disease so it'll be hard for him to travel so but we are very uh talkative on any video apps so we all have a very positive relationship together mm, that's perfect really it's all what it's all what the matter <laughs> okay um can you share with us if you have some bit experience in egypt 
I mean, I would be lying if I said no. It hasn't always okay. been unicorns and rainbows. <laughs> um, I would say that a lot of it stemmed from my own ignorance of this culture and the lack of experience I had because most of my problems happened when I first moved here and I was unaware of, you know, any anything like scams and stuff like that. But I did meet a man within my first month, actually, of living here, and mm -hmm. he was Egyptian and uh, he was a civil engineer in Oman and he was living in Cairo, back in Cairo to see his family for Ramadan. And um, I was an idiot and fell for his charms that were not, you know, legitimate. Yeah. Yeah, I know. And, but he, he, he messed up because I am unscammable. I will tell you why. I don't work. Okay. I was here living in Egypt on my family's support and whatever money I had from my tax return when I worked at the Egyptian restaurant in America. And uh, I refused to give a visa because my plan was to live here permanently. This was my new home. I had no intentions of giving someone a visa so we could live in America. I already know how the life is there and how difficult it is. Why would I want to start that? That was a train I was not going to get on. So you now this guy, he tried, you know, he, he made everything seem like before marriage, we were going to be everything fine and live in Cairo and it was going to be all good. He'd go to Oman and work and then come back and I would have like my own place, but it didn't turn out like that. Uh, and he didn't start showing his true colors until after marriage. And then he made the suggestion that, oh, you know, you're American, it's so easy for you to just go and get a job and go get us a house in America and buy us a car and just do everything and get me a visa and bring me over here. Uh, yeah, you got the wrong one for that. So I left mm -hmm. after three months of that, you know, yeah. and uh, started my life again over alone in this country, which was fine. That's how it started. That's how it should be. I'm not going to be with someone that's trying to use me for something. And not only that, he had become physically abusive and verbally abusive. His family was nuts. His mother, oh my goodness, you've heard the horror stories with mother-in-laws here, but mm. gosh, she, she was something. Mm. She would pretend to have a seizure to get attention. Uh, the father and the son would fight. Some, sometimes one of them would get a knife. I mean, it was kind of funny for me. I was 24 when this was going on. So for me, I'm just like kind of laughing about the situation because it, it was funny. Yeah. <laughs> I'll be honest. It was a hilarious thing to see. I'm new, new to Egypt, new to this culture, the language and everything was just a circus. So I thought, oh my goodness, this is so funny. Uh, but I, yeah, I did leave after all that. And I'm really glad I did because I see other women that stay in abusive marriages or get with a guy that's clear, clearly scamming them and they don't know. But yeah, this guy had no chance with me. I, I was not about to do anything for him in that aspect. Yeah, you are a very strong woman, Amir, really. I really admire you for this and even feel sorry that you had to experience something like this. But mm, look at you now. You are like the fate, Rebecca, you something very good. Now you are in so, I'm with amazing men and you have your family and you are so happy. So I think the life will back you. Yeah, my husband now is yeah, yeah. nothing, nothing like any experience I've had, even in Egypt or in America. He is the most kindest, diplomatic man I've ever met. Uh, he's never even yelled at me. He's never raised his voice, not once, not one single time. We've been together three years, almost three years. And uh, he's never called me a name. He's never made me feel unworthy. And of course, he's never hurt me physically in any kind of way. And I live my life very comfortable. He's an excellent provider. He's the funniest guy I ever met. And we have just the most loving, endearing relationship. And even with our age gap, uh, he's 13 years older than me. I'm about to be uh, 32 and he's going to be 44 here in just a few days. Hmm. But I love this uh, generation of the men here, the Arab men in their 40s, because I'll give some advice to any women listening. If you are searching for marriage to an Arab man, my advice, especially if he's from a third world country, go for a man 40 or older. And I'm, I'm telling you this from experience that they will be able to relate to you more. They'll be more established in their career. They'll be able to provide for you better. And they're going to be more educated and they're going to be more experienced in life. And they're not going to have this backwards mentality that exists here. And 
it, it'll just be a lot better for you. They, Arab men mature much slower in this country than they do. You, you cannot compare like a 25-year-old Egyptian guy to a 25-year-old American guy. When I, when I speak to a 25-year-old Egyptian, I feel like I'm talking to a child. No offense to any 25-year-old Egyptian guys listening, but not all are like this. But I'm just saying for any expat women who are looking to get into a marriage with an Egyptian, what would more than likely work for her? You know, you make me actually laugh because this is the mentality of Egyptian women. Do Egyptian women say this exactly? Like married uh, men like 10 years older, for example, you know? Yeah, that's true. Yeah. That's you for know, a reason. You, bec- you became Egyptian already. <laughs> you are not American anymore. <laughs> yeah, I've been told. I've been told. <laughs> but, but, you know, I still have my American ways. Yeah, for sure. But it's very nice. I mean, a compliment for you. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Okay, so let's leave the bad story and let's go for some good story. Um, do you have some very awesome memory in Egypt? Awesome memories in Egypt. There's so many. Oh, I don't one. even know where to begin. <laughs> Just one. Okay. Um, oh, how do I choose? Take your time. I guess I'll have to start with my... Um, my husband's distant family's village of Gafarea. It is a tiny little village, a couple hours drive outside of Cairo. And uh, I went there about a year and a half ago, I would say. Um, my husband and his family, even though they live in Cairo and they have all these, their establishments here, they are the kind of family that they didn't lose their roots. So they still keep in touch with their distant, an- distant family that that lives in a, in a village where they originally came yeah. from like, okay. I don't know, 80 years ago or something. So he took me there and I got to visit uh, the grave of his father and see like a very village cemetery. And it was just absolutely beautiful. And the simple life there, it was so quiet. It was so, it was, it was beautiful. It was nothing but farmland and just like these brick buildings everywhere, but it was a small community a very small community and there were animals like in the pasture. It was gorgeous. The people were very simple and very young. It was smiling. And of course I wore a hijab to be, you know, mm-hmm. polite and to be respectful of the community yeah. that I was going to be in. But I got to walk around and take a look and, and just see like this magical atmosphere of this very simple life and how friendly the people were and how warming and welcoming and endearing and just the beauty of this, this different world, I would say. I, I absolutely loved it. And I got to meet his family. And his uh, great uncle is an imam. So it was a real pleasure to meet him and have some discussions with him about religion. And I was welcomed into their home. And uh, they have like their own apartment building. And it's like five or six stories high. And the whole family lives there. Like, you know, husband and wife live on the first floor, another husband and wife on the second floor with their kids and so on and so forth. So I was invited to this whole like tight knit community and I got to dine with them. And I got to sit on the floor of the, we had our our dinner on the roof of the building and it was, the sun was setting and we were all eating mashi and the kids were playing and you could hear roosters crowing in the background. It, It was just surreal. I loved it. Yeah, that sounds really awesome. I wish to be there. <laughs> okay. Um, actually, what's your favorite food, Egyptian? Or do you cook Egyptian food actually by yourself? I make some. Some of it's a, a bit complicated for me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, I love I love koshery. That's my favorite. Koshery, I love it. Mm-hmm. Um, and I can make hawaushi. I, I also very much love hawaushi. I can make that. Mm-hmm. And I make the dough from scratch. I don't use the baladi bread. I don't really like baladi bread. No offense to anybody, but it's just not for yeah, me. Yeah. I like to have my bread warm and fresh out the oven and and uh, without all the breadcrumbs on it. Yeah, how about mashi, the national food? Do you like it? I love mashi and crump is my favorite kind. And really? I don't know how to make it, but I do. Yeah, I don't know how to. I don't know how to make it, but I know how to roll it. And I learned how to do that from a neighbor that I had when I was living here alone. Mm-hmm. It's not that hard. I can send you the recipe or show you, but I don't like. Yeah, it, I love actually. that. <laughs> okay. Um, really? What's your yeah. favorite kind? Um, I guess koshari also. It's very love good for koshari. me. 
Yeah. But you know, Alexandria. Yeah. I love uh, Bamia as well. Yeah, can be. I agree. But you know, here in Alexandria, it's a little bit different because most of the time the people eat a fish and the seafood. And it's something what I absolutely hate. I cannot eat this. So I prefer like the food from Cairo better than from Alexandria. I've tried some food from Alexandria when we go there in the summertime. And I, I do prefer the uh, fatir there much better than the fatir of Cairo. Mm, yes, that's true. That's a little bit better. Okay. <laughs> okay, Amira. Um, another question is, if you ever work it in Egypt, did you have a job here? In no, Egypt? I've never worked here and never, never really wanted to. It, it's just not, I'm, I did my work in America. You know, mm -hmm. I'm retired. I always joke about that and tell people, you know, that ask me, are you working? No, I'm retired. What, how old are you? Yeah, I've been retired since I was 24. I'm good. I, I'm no longer working. I'm married and I'm a mom. That, that's a job right there. So I'm good. Yeah, I agree with you. That's not neat. Okay. And um, my last question will be actually, how do you like the Egyptian lifestyle? Did you, or how to say it? Are you now like an Egyptian people? Like, or you still have the American lifestyle, like more active? Um, I would say that I'm probably living very much like I would have in America. I have lived the Egyptian lifestyle before mm -hmm. and I liked it. And it was, you know, I lived in a very simple area before and I, I had this simple life and I did all of that and it was a very wonderful experience a very positive experience but you know I am someone that I wasn't planning on living like that permanently so when I got married you know I wanted to be with someone that lived an Americanized lifestyle like what I was accustomed to but at the same time you know have their Islamic values and traditional roots so that's what I found and that's what works for me and I'm, I'm extremely happy with uh, mm. our, the way we run our household and how our lifestyle is. Okay. Um, and I, I wouldn't me. change it for anything. But tell me, when do you wake up in Egypt? What time? Yeah, what time? Um, well, it varies. I mean, depending on when my daughter's going to wake up. But before she was born, I would say I'm pretty nocturnal like the Egyptians. You know, go to bed at 2 or 3 a.m. and wake up at noon to 1 yeah, that's why I asked. But after because... the baby came, yeah, yeah um, after the baby came, uh, that changed. Today we woke up at 11, and I consider that a good day. 11? No, madam. You are Egyptian. Definitely Egyptian. <laughs> because, yeah, okay. <laughs> because, you know, in the, I don't know how in America, but in the Europe, most of we wake up at 5 or 6 a.m. very soon, and I guess America should be similar, right? I mean, it depends on the family. My family, we were people that sleep till maybe 10. Hmm. And I was someone that I preferred to work nights when I did have a job. Yeah. I'm not a morning person. You don't want to see me in the morning. And especially if I haven't had my coffee, I'm not a friendly, friendly face at all. Okay, I'll remember it. <laughs> I'll <be about laughs> you next time. Okay. Yeah, when, I, when I've had jobs before, it was usually like the night shift or the graveyard shift. And that's really what I preferred. That's what, I've always been nocturnal by nature, so I guess I really didn't have any problems adapting to that here. Mm, okay, that's great. Okay, Amira, do you want to add something more? Do you want to say, share something more with us? Um, I don't know. I mean, overall, my experience in Cairo has been very, very positive. My experience in Egypt overall has been positive. And if I was going to recommend anyone to come here I would tell them you know especially if you're coming here for marriage mm -hmm. and you met your significant other online that you come here first before jumping into a marriage with him right away and spend some time here and get to know him and get to know his family and do the research of the culture and the religion if you're not Muslim and he is so you know what your rights are and what's normal and what's not what's acceptable and what's not so you don't find yeah. yourself in an unpleasant situation yeah exactly i agree with you okay amira thank you so much for joining us today i loved your story very much okay thank you so much for having me it has really been so much fun yeah for me too okay amira thank you so much have a nice day bye thank you